Okay, everybody, welcome to MAT 1350. Uh, let me remind you uh, where we were. So, um, we started looking for some systematic theory of not invariance, and the idea is to look for not invariants that behave like polynomials on the space of knots. And um, uh, so, given a knot v, sorry, given a knot invariant v, so it's defined on oriented knot in oriented R3, and takes values, well, last time I failed to say where it takes values, but the only operation I used was subtraction. And it was clear that it needed to be commutative because I was subtracting things or I was doing alternating sum of, sums of things in bulk. And it, it was clear that there was no particular way to order them. So uh, the values should be in an abelian group. Typically, it will be the integers, the rational, some ring of polynomials, something like that. Okay? And then we defined, defined the mth derivative of v, namely uh, v up m, and it's evaluated on knots with m double points by saying that you pick one of the double points and you resolve it either to an overcrossing or to an undercrossing. You take v up m minus 1 evaluated on that, on, on either of the two possibilities, and take the difference in that abelian group. Okay? And um, uh, v is of... And, and then we defined a uh, sort of polynomial, and I'm not sure if I, I said it explicitly, but I, I uh, so the definition is V is of type M, means that its M plus first derivative is equal to zero. Okay? And um, often it's, in, and alternatively, sometimes it's called Vasiliev of type M, named after Vasiliev, Viktor Vasiliev, who first wrote about such invariants. And uh, if an invariant is of type M for some M, it is called finite type. Okay? All, all the definitions sort of make sense. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, so, alternatively, or just, just to say differently, a different way to say it is to say that V up M plus 1 evaluated on a knot with uh, m plus 1 uh, double points. Oh, sorry, I, I have a, a lag, and I think it's my fault. It's because I failed to, to pause a computation. So uh, let me pause it. Sorry, this will take a second. And once the computation is paused, um, uh, uh, the, the lag will disappear. Sorry about that. So, um, so uh, it's the same as saying that V evaluated on a knot with M plus 1 double points is equal to 0. And there is superfluous information here, right? Uh, you don't really need to write the M plus 1 here because you can read it by counting the number of double points. Okay? So often this uh, M plus 1 is suppressed. So often you just don't write it. So V evaluated on something with M plus 1 double point, with N double point just means V up M. Okay? And finally, well, if the invariant vanishes, if the, der if the M plus first derivative vanishes, then all higher der derivatives vanish too. Okay? So often this is written, instead of the way I wrote it, it is written as, uh, v evaluated on more than m double points is equal to zero. That's nothing. That's just um, minor things. Okay? So, um, you know, it's possible that there aren't any finite type invariants. So, I better give you some examples. Okay? So, uh, examples. Uh, let me start from example zero. So, example zero. Uh, uh, if V is identically equal to a constant, 
Uh, and maybe this is a bit confusing because I don't mean V, the derivatives, I mean the original V. So maybe if I really, really wanted to emphasize, I'll add here V up zero. So if V up zero is equal to a constant, then uh, V up one uh, uh, is going to be, uh, well, V up zero evaluated on uh, an overcrossing. Ugh, that's an undercrossing. Why do I keep doing this? Um, uh, it will be uh, V up zero evaluated on an overcrossing minus V up zero evaluated on an undercrossing, and that's uh, C minus C, and it's equal to zero. So, uh, uh, so uh, this invariant is of type one, sorry, of type zero, because already its first derivative is equal to zero. So this is of type uh, zero, and here is the reasoning. And uh, compare with ordinary polynomials, for ordinary polynomials, um, the, the, uh, the constants are considered to be of degree zero. Okay? Good. Uh, example one. So, example one, unfortunately, uh, is something that we haven't talked about yet. So, maybe it's time to talk about it. So, suppose you have, so, if uh, L is a two-component link, so remember, a uh, link is, a link is a knot with more than one component. Okay, so basically instead of one circle tied up, it's two circles tied up in our case. Okay, so if L is a, a link with two components, you can define LK of L. So LK stands for the linking uh, number of K. So the linking number of K is the sum over all uh, uh, x's which are crossings between uh, the two uh, components. So I am not counting crossings in which a component cross itself. I'm, on, I'm only com counting um, crossings that in which one component crosses over another, okay? Uh, of uh, minus one to the crossing, so the sign of the crossing is defined exactly as it was defined earlier, and I failed to put here a one-half, so I'll add it now, okay? So, for example, um, the linking number of the so-called Hopflink, so this is the Hopflink, uh, is equal to, oops, I don't know what it's equal to. It depends how I orient it. So the link has to be oriented, so let's say it is oriented this way. And then this crossing is a positive crossing. Uh, this crossing here is also a positive crossing. So the linking number is half of 1 plus 1, which is 1. So, uh, okay, rather easy definition. It's easy to check that the link linking number is invariant under uh, Reidemeister 1 and Reidemeister 2. So, sorry, it's invariant under... Uh, all Reidemeister moves. So Reidemeister 1, Reidemeister 2, Reidemeister 3. These two we already checked. So these two uh, we checked in the context in the context, context of computing the Rye. And uh, the difference is extremely minor. I mean you, you can check that exactly, exactly the same reasoning still applies. This one failed when we computed the Rife. 
However, uh, the failure, or uh, I mean, a, a Reitermeister move, Reitermeister one move, involves a crossing between a component and itself. So this one simply doesn't count, is not counted. So we get invariant un uh, invariants under Reitermeister one. So, and this is perhaps the easiest example there is, and there is actually quite a lot to say about it. Uh, but, 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 but maybe not now. Uh, I'll only say that um, uh, it's of finite type. So why is it of finite type? So uh, I need to comp oh sorry, I mean before saying that it's of finite type, I should say that the definition of finite type uh, extends to links completely trivially, right? Exactly the same. And, um, and so it makes sense to ask if it is of finite type. And it is clearly of finite type. Why? So uh, if I compute uh, V, or sorry, now it's not V, now it's called LK. So if I compute uh, LK on a double point, well, there are two possibilities. Either both sides of the double point belong to the same component, so maybe both belong to component 1, okay? Well, in this case, if you resolve it to an overcrossing or resolve it to an undercrossing, it doesn't matter, you get 0, right? Because so it doesn't matter, you get the same answer, because this crossing anyway doesn't count, so the difference is equal to 0. Okay, and on the other hand, if you are looking at a crossing uh, which involve, involves the, both components, so one strand belongs to component one and the other strand belongs to component two, sorry, not a crossing, a double point. If you're looking at a double point in which the two sides belong to the to two components, you end up looking at the difference between the linking number of uh, a... A, a, an overcrossing and the linking number of an undercrossing. So these will be exactly the same sums except only one summand changes from plus one, one to minus one. Plus one minus minus one is two. We divide by two, so uh, the answer is one. Okay? Uh, but then if you differentiate this a second time, you get zero. Okay? So the first derivative is not quite constant. You get either zero or one. But if you differentiate it a second time, so if I'm now looking at the linking at LK, uh, LK evaluated on a knot with two double points, then no matter what, so you first resolve the first double point. If it's 1, 1, you get uh, 0 minus 0 when you resolve the second double point. Because, in, because, because no matter what, the second, uh, you, after resolving the first double point, you're going to get 0 minus 0. Uh, if you have 1, 2, after resolving the second double point, you'll get 1 minus 1, and in both cases you end up getting 0. So overall, uh, you, you, you see that the linking number vanishes if you have two double points, which really means that the linking number uh, is of type uh, 1. Okay, next. Actually, here is a minor generalization. So, really, really minor, and so far it should be boring, because the invariants we were looking at before were much more exciting, but still, let's go through it. So, uh, if L is a link with uh, N components uh, labeled uh, 1 up to N, uh, then uh, let Lij, oops, sorry, uh, 
sorry, let L I J be uh, the uh, linking uh, number of uh, component number I with uh, component number J. So, uh, you know, you can define it to be either as the previous invariance, the linking number, restricted to the, or computed on the node in which you drop all the components except component i and j, or you can simply define it directly, so lij is one half the sum over all crosses, so uh, all, all crossings x, which is a crossing between uh, those two components, so i and j, uh, of minus 1 to the x. I've wasted your time. I just made the definition. It's clear that lij is of type uh, 1, the same, as, uh, the same as the two component case. Okay, that was sort of a waste of time, but uh, I wanted to go through it. So now let's look at example number three. So, uh, the right isn't a not invariant, okay? Because it's invariant under Reidemeister 2 and Reidemeister 3, but not under Reidemeister 1. But there is a way to upgrade it to a not invariant, and uh, it's well worth to know about this way because it's useful in many, many, many other places. So, uh, uh, but, but what you do is, instead of talking about knots, you talk about framed knots. So, what's a framed knot? So, a framed knot... So, a framed knot is... Um, uh, I guess there are several ways well, two ways to view it, okay, or uh, uh, more than one way to view it. So, one way to view it is to say it's a, a smooth curve in R3 together with a choice of a normal vector to the curve at every point. So, at every point you choose a vector normal to the curve and this choice is itself uh, up to homotopy. So, two such choices are considered the same if you can spin the normal vectors from one choice into the other in the normal plane without passing through zero. So, sorry, I should have said all of these normal vectors should be non-zero. So, uh, this is uh, a knot with an up to homotopy, homotopy uh, choice of a non-zero uh, normal uh, at every uh, point. Of course, varying continuously. Okay? So that's one way to see it. And uh, for the other way to see it, I have to run to the other room and fetch a band. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. So for the other way to see it, uh, you take a band, instead of knotting a piece of string, like a one-dimensional piece of string like this one, uh, you knot, maybe I'll come closer to the camera, instead you, want, you knot a band. So a band is like a belt, in fact this is a belt, I just took it out of my closet. So, uh, when, you knot, when you knot a belt, okay, first of all, belts are very easy to knot, belts are very easy to knot, because all you have to do is to tie them, right? But a belt has um, uh, two sides, 
and you can think of one side as being the knot and the other side as being the other end of the normal. And it's easy to check that it doesn't matter which side you pick as the knot and which side you pick as the other end of the normal. Okay? Uh, good. So, um, um, so two comments, so a few comments. So first of all, a framed knot is essentially, it's a minor extension of a knot. So if you have uh, two framings of the same knot, then they differ by an integer. Basically, if you have uh, two, um, two belts that are physically placed in the same way, except possibly with different uh, um, number of, uh, except possibly with different uh, rotations, or possibly with different normals, then you can easily uh, bring all the, all the kinks, all the, all the uh, self, um, all the places, basically, uh, basically you can, you can, you can straighten uh, one belt or you can straighten one belt to look like the other and push all the twists to some small region and then you have uh, lots and lots of twists in some small region I don't know um, uh, like like here I don't know let's put some more and all you have to do to compare the two belts is to count the number of twists twists okay so uh, a framed knot a a framed knot, a framed uh, knot uh, differs from an unframed one uh, by just one uh, integer uh, parameter. And to be more precise, uh, what I mean is that if you have two framed knots that are the same as ordinary knots, that are the same except for the framing, then the two framings differ by an integer. Or you can, the, there, there is one integer parameter to count how the two framings differ. Okay? Uh, good. Now, uh, framed, so, so um, I mean, uh, at first this looks a bit artificial, but later you see that almost everything in knot theory is better behaved for framed knots than for unframed knots. Okay? So, so, so that's actually an important definition. Anyway, um, the definition of finite type makes sense just as well. So, uh, basically, you can speak about a one singular frame knot. So, a one singular frame knot will be a knot with a singularity in which uh, each uh, side or each, well, in which every, uh, which is still framed, and the framing is just completely, completely obli oblivious to the singularity. Okay? Or if you want, you can think of it as a band that's allowed to self-intersect once. Okay? And then this has two resolutions just as before. So the positive resolution and the negative resolution. And the two resolutions are obtained by doing sort of a an, 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 an nearly infinitesimal motion around the double point and you can just carry the framing with you. So uh, you can, uh, so the framing is well defined uh, even after uh, the uh, resolution. So it makes sense to uh, compute differences just as before, it makes sense to define finite type just as before, and therefore um, it makes sense to, to, the, to make the following definition. So, sorry, to, to, to make the following calculation. So, 
uh, first of all, definition, uh, if uh, K is a framed uh, knot, uh, we define the self-linking of K, so this is the self-linking uh, of K, to be the linking of K with the knot that you get by pushing K a little bit in the direction of the framing. Right? The, the framing is really, in, or could, can be thought of as instructions in, uh, or, like in which direction to push the knot a little bit. Okay? So, let me call it the linking between K and K plus, where K plus is uh, the uh, push of K in the uh, direction of the uh, framing. Okay? A tiny push, tiny, tiny push. Uh, now, uh, alternatively, if you're thinking of a knot as a knotted band or a knotted, a knotted belt, the self-linking is uh, the linking of the two sides of the belt, the two edges of the belt. Okay? So, uh, it's, uh, you know what, I, I think I'll be wasting your time if I'll uh, uh, prove it in detail, but exactly the same arguments as before shows that SL is of type uh, 1. You know what, M let me make it e even easier, okay? So, uh, uh, No, let me not make it easier. Let me uh, add another exercise. Exercise. Uh, and the question is, what's the uh, relationship uh, between uh, the self-linking of a framed knot and, and the right? of that knot, as defined uh, earlier in class. Okay, so now, now we have a few examples in degrees of type 0 and 1, and in fact these are all the examples of type 0 and 1, uh, as we will see later. So, uh, let's go a bit higher, so, um, uh, but for this, I need to, t yeah? Uh, so, can we think of the Mobius band as a framing of the of the unknot? Uh, good question. Um, I should have. Okay. There are two. You can say yes or no, depending on your opinion. Uh, and I think everything that I said uh, holds. Uh, no matter how you define it. I think more standardly, uh, people uh, want the uh, band that you end up getting by uh, pushing the knot a little bit in the direction of the framing, so in other words, the, just the belt, people want it to be orientable. So if you decide that it's orientable, then uh, the Mobius band is forbidden. Okay, but 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 both both definitions make sense. Both possibilities make sense. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, uh, you know what? Uh, let me remind you uh, that uh, we that at some point we found the so-called Skein relation of the Jones polynomial, which says the following. If you look at uh, Q inverse times the Jones polynomial of an overcrossing, 
uh, minus Q times uh, the Jones polynomial of the same crossing replaced by an undercrossing. Oops, sorry, I forgot the J. Uh, sorry. So minus Q times uh, the Jones polynomial of uh, uh, the same thing replaced by an undercrossing. Uh, then you get uh, Q to the one half minus Q to the minus one half times the Jones polynomial of the oriented smoothing. The smoothing in which the orientation is preserved. So we've computed this at some point and we know it to be true. It's actually not what I want to tell you about right now. I will go back to it in a moment, but it's not what I want to tell you about. I want to tell you that there is another invariant which, with a similar behavior, and it's called uh, the Conway polynomial. So the Conway uh, polynomial, named after John Conway, who I'm sure you know passed away from COVID a few months ago. So the same Conway. So the Conway polynomial is an invariant C defined on uh, uh, knots and links, so basically links with an arbitrary number of components, with values in uh, polynomials in a variable called Z, and it is defined by two uh, properties. So property one is a simplified version of the Skine relation of the Jones polynomial, and it's really simplified. C of an overcrossing minus C of an undercrossing is equal to Z times C of the oriented smoothing. And the second property is that C evaluated on an unknot with K, of an unlink with k components is equal to uh, 1 if k is equal to 1 and 0 otherwise. Okay? So I am not proving... To, okay, sorry. First of all, if such an in, in, in invariant exists, it is unique. Or said differently, these two properties are enough to compute uh, the Conway polynomial of any knot or any link. Why? Because exactly the same reasoning why we saw before that the Skine relation of the Jones polynomial is enough to compute the Jones polynomial of any knot. So basically, if you want to compute the, the, the Conway polynomial of some link, you know that by crossing changes, you can uh, turn it to the unlink. So by crossing changes, you can compute, you, you can change the computation from the computation of the link you want to the computation of, uh, of this link, whose values are given. But each crossing change comes with a cost. The cost is the Conway polynomial of a link with one crossing less. So by induction, you've computed this already yesterday, okay? So in principle, you, you, so, so you can compute the Conway polynomial uh, of every link this way. By the way, this is horribly inefficient. There are much better ways to compute the Conway polynomial. But this is good enough for now, okay? Uh, sorry, this means that the Conway polynomial is unique. It doesn't yet mean that it's well-defined because it's possible that uh, if you start from a complicated link, there are two different ways to reduce it to the unknot by, by crossing changes, and the two different ways when you use this algorithm to, to compute will give you different answers. So it's actually a non-trivial theorem uh, that this is well-defined. So theorem, uh, this uh, gives a well-defined uh, uh, invariant. Unique, we understand, and the problem why is why, why would it be well-defined? 
So maybe one day we'll go back to the theorem because there's a lot to say about it. And in fact, it's the tip of a huge iceberg. Uh, but before, uh, I want to relate it to finite type invariants. So the claim is that the Conway polynomial is not a finite type invariant. However, all the information in it is contained in finite type invariants. So uh, let me explain. So theorem. So suppose you write, so if you write uh, the Conway polynomial of a knot or a link L, uh, and it's a function of a variable z. So if you write it as a polynomial in z, so you write it as a sum as n goes or m goes from 0 to infinity of uh, v sub m of k uh, times z to the n where v sub m is simply the m coefficient of the polynomial, okay? For every specific link, since the Conway polynomial is a polynomial, so for every specific link, this will be a finite sum. But you don't know in advance where it will stop, okay? Anyway, this v, so since if the Conway polynomial is an invariant, and well, if you know the co polynomial, you know its coefficients, you, you, so you can extract the v sub m's. So these v sub m's are also invariants. So these are invariants with values, well, the coefficients were integers, so these are invariants with values in z. Okay? And then uh, the claim is that, uh, so, if you write this in that way, uh, then uh, V sub M uh, is, oh, sorry, I wrote of K, I meant of L, sorry. This should be, uh, I, I should be using the same uh, letter on both sides, okay. So the claim is that V sub L is of type, sorry, V sub M is of type M. Okay, so again, the Conway polynomial as a whole is not of finite type, but every coefficient is of finite type. Okay, uh, proof, well, the proof is sort of tautological, so you see, or almost tautological, or nearly empty. So you see, the left hand side of the relation defining the Conway polynomial is also what we would call C of a double point. So C of a double point is equal to this. Okay? So, um, uh, so now, uh, suppose you are trying to compute C of uh, a knot with uh, M plus 1 double points. Then, uh, well, the first double point you resolve to an over minus under, and an over minus under is equal to a z times a smooth thing. So you get this is equal to z times the Conway polynomial of the knot that you get by replacing the first double point by a smoothing and keeping all the rest. But now you continue by induction, and uh, you get z to the m plus 1 evaluated, so each each step gives you one factor of z. So you do it m plus 1 times, you get z to the m plus 1 times the Conway polynomial computed on the knot in which all double points were replaced by uh, smoothings. But I don't actually care uh, what's on the right hand side. I mean, I actually don't care about this because it's enough to know that the coefficient of z to the m here is equal to zero because this is a polynomial that get because whatever this is it gets multiplied by z to the m plus one. So uh, so uh, uh, v m on uh, on a knot with 
uh, m plus 1 double points, well, this is the coefficient of, of z to the m in this. So this is the coefficient of uh, z to the m in uh, c of that thing. Uh, but since that, but, but, but the coefficient of z to the m in this is equal to zero because it has a z to the m plus one factor in front. QED? Okay. Uh, maybe the last example of that type, and I will not finish it. So, example. Uh, now the Jones polynomial. So the Jones polynomial uh, was defined by, so I think this is example 5, I'm not sure. So uh, the Jones polynomial satisfies Q inverse, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I just wrote it, but I still have to write it again. So Q inverse J of uh, an overcrossing. So could I ask a question about the Conway polynomial? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so so you, you said that okay, so 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 the, the coefficient is equal to zero because it's C of all of the crossings have been all of the singularities have been smoothed. Yes. Uh, but but it's why is the thing zero again? It, no, it's not C of all of the singularities being smoothed. It's z to the m plus one. It's the coefficient of z to the m in z to the m plus one times something. Is the coefficient of z? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, look. Uh, uh, v sub m is the coefficient of z to the m in this. The co therefore, the coefficient of z to the m in this. But this is z to the m plus 1 times something. So the coefficient of z to the m is equal to 0. Okay. Okay? Okay. So the last example is the Jones polynomial. So Q inverse J of an overcrossing minus Q of uh, J of an ah sorry I keep mm, I keep writing the wrong thing. So uh, minus G, uh, G Q times Z of an undercrossing is equal to uh, Q to the one half minus Q to the negative one half. Uh, J of a uh, smoothing, okay, and uh, 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 and there is also some um, uh, initial condition for the unknot, for sorry for the unlink, but in fact the initial condition plays no role. It's enough to know this. So the moment I know this, I claim the following. Well, the Jones polynomial is not uh, of finite type, but if you compute J of any link, so uh, this will be a function of Q, but instead of Q, you make the substitution. So instead of writing Q, you make the substitution Q is equal to e to the x. Uh, well, then what you get, well, so... Uh, the Jones polynomial actually is a Laurent polynomial in Q and Q inverse, but uh, you'll get a various combinations of e to the x and e to the minus x, uh, but whichever way you do, what, whatever you do, you can tailor expand it as a power series in x, so you can write this as a sum uh, m goes from 0 to infinity, again let me call it vm, so Vm of L times x to the m, okay? And my claim is that um, uh, each sub Vm is of type uh, m, okay? And the proof is kind of silly. You just take this, this relation written here and replace q with e to the x and start expanding okay so you'll get uh, so uh, uh, q 
to the minus 1 is e to the minus x, e to the minus x is 1 minus x plus, uh, anybody remembers, x squared over 7 or something, who cares, it doesn't matter. So you get this times the Jones polynomial of an overcrossing minus uh, q is 1 plus x uh, uh, ma plus more terms times uh, the Jones polynomial of an undercrossing and the crucial bit is that q to the one half is 1 plus x uh, q to the minus one, is, minus one half is 1 minus x sorry, is 1 plus x over 2 q to the minus one half is 1 minus x over 2 the difference is x so you get here x plus higher order terms times j of a smoothing Okay, but now uh, I can, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong key. Uh, now I can uh, move all the junk, so the terms I want on the left are this one and that one. And I can simply move all the junk to the right. So I'll get uh, that uh, J of an overcrossing minus j of an undercrossing is equal to so here I have x plus higher order terms so x plus higher order terms times uh, j of an uh, uh, oh it was an overcrossing And then I get uh, here, or actually it's my, wait, if I move it to the other side, it becomes x. Now if I move this x to the other side, I also get x plus higher terms times j of an undercrossing. And here this side, this term just remains on the other side, so it's x plus more things times j of a smoothing. Now, I don't care about all of this junk. The point is that this junk always has an x in it. Always starts with an x. So this is x times junk. Okay? But this, the left hand side, is just j of a double point. So the conclusion is that j of a double point is x times junk, where junk means lots of coefficients multipl uh, uh, compu uh, multiplying j of various other knots that are obtained by local uh, operations, replacing the double point either by an overcrossing or by an undercrossing or by a smoothing. So, uh, but now you do, but now the argument continues exactly the same as in the case of Alexander. So if you have j on something with uh, uh, m plus 1 double points, then you apply this argument for each crossing separately, and you'll get x to the m plus 1 times, uh, well, lots of junk. I mean, I'll write it as junk to the m plus 1, but this is informal. Really what I mean is lots and lots of junk. Okay? But it doesn't matter because it proves the theorem. Okay? So, uh, I'm sort of out of time. Uh, and not sort of out of time. I'm out of time and I'm also out of um, uh, pages. Uh, so, uh, I'll only say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll only say that uh, next time we will we, okay, these were just examples. And next time we will start a systematic theory. So we will look for all finite type invariants. And it turns out that there is, well, I don't know if a classification, but a reduction to combinatorics. 
So a reduction from infinite knot theory to finite combinatorics, at least for every specific type. So if you want to know what are all invariant types or all finite type invariants of type 10, it's a completely combinator finite combinatorial question for which the answer is known. Okay? Uh, but that will be next time, so see you on Wednesday. And um, I don't know, questions, comments? Yeah, a question. Yeah. Uh, so does the choice of substitution matter? Uh, uh, for example, in this case, you chose Q to be D to the X. No. All I needed, so excellent question, on all I needed was that Q uh, would look like 1 plus X plus higher order terms. Okay? Because then Q inverse would look like 1 minus, minus X plus higher order terms and Q to the 1 half minus Q to the minus 1 half would also look like X plus high. So basically all I needed is that it would start with 1 plus X. The common substitution to, to make is E to the X but it's really not necessary. You could have done 1 plus X just as well. Other questions? So how does how does g of the uh, smoothing n plus one singularities equals x plus x to the n plus one times a bunch of junk? How does this imply that it is not a finite type invariant again? No, it is a finite type invariant. It's not that it is not. It is a finite type invariant. The point is, I mean, the theorem is that it is. Okay. Right. The point is that. It doesn't matter what this junk is. The thing written on the right has uh, the coefficient of x to the m is equal to zero because it is something multiplied by x to the m plus one. Yes, but th this shows that the, the, the x to the m coefficient of the Jones polynomial is a finite time invariant. It doesn't show that the entire Jones polynomial is a finite time invariant. And it is not. It's exactly like this, the Alexander, I, I never claimed it is. It's the same as the Alexander polynomial, right? Okay. The, it's, it, the Jones polynomial is not a finite type invariant, but every coefficient is. Okay. Okay? So, uh, uh, so all the, but if you know all the coefficients of the Jones polynomial, you, don't, you know the Jones polynomial. So, so you have enough inform so if you know all finite type invariants, you know the Jones polynomial. Okay? But you need all of them. Or not all of them, but you need infinitely many of them. Because there are infinitely many coefficients. Okay? So in principle we can try a variant of this for any kind of relation by finding the right function to make things cancel. Yeah, so in fact, in fact uh, uh, the Jones polynomial is just one an yet another example. In fact, z z there are lots of invariants coming from sort of quantum algebra, so one for every Lie algebra and every representation, and they are all finite type by the same reasoning. Okay? Except we haven't talked about them, so I cannot give them as examples yet. Okay? And furthermore, the easiest way to realize that there is, an in, that there is a relationship between finite type invariants and b between not invariants and Lie algebras is this way, is to start from finite type invariants. Okay? Okay. So I'll quit and see you on Wednesday. Bye.